Good. Welcome to my wonderful talk, Securing a Search Engine While Maintaining Usability. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about Elasticsearch, but not how you use it or anything like that. Um, my main intention of all of this is basically that I explain how we do certain things within the Elasticsearch code base to keep it as secure as we think it can be. Um, all I'm going to talk about is open source, so you can just rip it out, use it for your own projects. Um, and that's basically the whole idea. Like, I will just show you how we do things, and you might think that this makes actually sense in your own code base. Uh, so yeah, hi, I'm there. I'm Alex. Um, I'm a husband, dad, community advocate. I've been on the Elasticsearch core team for a couple of years before switching jobs recently. Um, I live in Munich, but Elastic is a fully distributed company. So we are more than 1,500 people, basically all across the world. Uh, we have an office in Munich, but I never go there. Like, if you talk to, want to talk to me about home office, um, I'm a huge fan. Um, and yeah, we are the, the company behind the Elastic Stack, uh, which has a couple of products, um, open source, uh, and a couple of commercial extensions, uh, and of course a whole ecosystem around it, like support, training, consulting, running all of this on premise uh, and as a service. All right, before I proceed, uh, just to make sure who of you knows Elasticsearch, just a quick show of hands. That's a majority, that makes my job incredibly easy, it's awesome. Um, so Elasticsearch at its core is just a full text search engine or a search engine which can be used for stuff like full text search, which you know from uh, Google, you type something into Google, you get back all the documents where the terms included. Uh, you can use it for analytics or business intelligence, whatever you call it. Uh, you can use it for geo-based search whenever you execute a search on, on Yelp or whatever, searching for a restaurant that's running Elasticsearch in the background. Whenever you search something on GitHub or Wikipedia, this is running Elasticsearch. Um, all of this is supposed to be run in, in real time, so the time between indexing a document and making it available for search should be super, super short. The interesting part is Elasticsearch is distributed and scalable, which means you can run it on one node, you can run it on 100 nodes. Uh, you can scale out, like adding more nodes, or scaling up, like buying more expensive hardware. Um, it's supposed to be highly available, which is kind of a misnomer. Uh, the whole idea is it's resilient, because if you use commodity hardware, the more nodes you add, the higher will be the, the likelihood of a failure. Um, so the whole idea is that the system itself notices failure and adapts itself to change its conditions, so that every time you lose a node, the system itself makes sure that there are enough copies of your data available in the cluster. The interface to communicate with Elasticsearch is HTTP and JSON. The whole idea is basically that every developer hopefully knows HTTP and JSON, so there's at least no new object notation to learn if you, if you want to uh, interface with Elasticsearch. And Elasticsearch itself, it's kind of the, the center's piece or the heart of the Elastic stack with all the products around it. This is my fully uneducated guess, which I don't have any backing evidence for. Um, but from my personal experience, I suppose there are like tens of thousands of clusters running with Elasticsearch all across the road, which means there are potentially hundreds of thousands of instances running, which means it's quite a big attack surface, right? Like if someone finds security hole in Elasticsearch, he potentially found a couple of hundred thousand security holes, which also means we have to take security pretty seriously. We still tell people don't put Elasticsearch in the internet, uh, turns out that if you write something down in the internet, it doesn't particularly happen. Um, and this means we have to think about this in a, in a constant way of fashion. So this is my plan for today. Um, I want to talk about um, yeah, security. Is it a feature, a non-functional requirement? I want to talk about the security manager. Uh, production mode versus development mode, which is less of a security topic, but again, an important topic, which I hope you can just take home, uh, where it's about like, what can we do to detect if we're running in production or in development? Uh, I want to talk about plugins. Um, if you're maintaining and writing a software at your customers and you don't have to take care of plugins, that's great. Um, don't ever think about it. But if you do, like, what do you need to keep in mind? And I want to quickly talk about scripting. All right, F security. Feature or non-functional requirement. It's kind of a bit of both, right? Um, of course, everyone is like, software has to be secure. Uh, yeah, that's a great sentence, but that doesn't particularly help you to achieve anything of that. Uh, if you ask a developer, he's more like, oh yeah, we have to like do defensive programming, catch every error, what have you. Um, if you ask a business guy, uh, he's going to tell you, yeah, security is we don't want to store certain data, so we can get a PCI DSS certification if we don't store credit card data or if we don't persist it. Uh, if you ask someone who doesn't know a lot about security, he's going to explain you that his software is not exploitable. Um, 
That's not particularly happening, I suppose. Um, there are interesting developments recently, like stuff like Rust, preventing like buffer overflows and things like that on compile time phase, which I think is, is a really nice approach. Um, but we still have a long way to go on software not being exploitable. Especially if humans are using it, you can just exploit the humans instead of the software if you need to get the data. Um, yeah, there's a wonderful um, thing about this one. So I dubbed it, you want to prevent unintended resource access, like a directory traversal attack. Those are super common. You just add a couple of dots in a web server and suddenly you can access certain files. Um, and this is a wonderful thing that surfaced 2017 that uh, Siemens actually issued a CVE entry about their dishwasher. And their dishwasher had a directory traversal attack, which means you could read a file like etc shadow from this uh, dishwasher, and you could do other funny things. And Siemens just said, oh yeah, we fixed this. The main point here is like, is it good to fix a directory traversal attack, or should you probably just shut down the frigging web server in your dishwasher, right? There are two ways of solving this issue, and I'm not sure if like, Siemens picked the right way here. Um, this is another thing just to, to think about in terms of security. If you don't need something to have up and running, please shut it down. Um, yeah, there's always a least privilege principle. Make sure you don't run certain services with privileges. If you don't need to, make sure you can drop privileges if possible. Um, and of course, if bad things happen, and I don't think there's an if, there's only a when, um, make sure that you reduce the impact surface by maybe layering security, what have you, and we're going to talk about that later in the context of Elasticsearch as well. What I don't want to talk about today is security as a feature. Um, Elasticsearch has all these kind of features, uh, authentication or authorization uh, against other systems, TLS, audit logging, um, using single sign-on, some log cameras. Um, and this is more for me like security from an integration perspective, right? You want to integrate with other systems. Uh, you want to make sure you only have a sample user repository, these kind of things. Um, and this is what I consider today as security as a feature, and that's not what I'm going to talk about. Also, like the, the borders are kind of blurry. Um, so imagine integrity checks. If you do an integrity check with this uh, an TLS packet, for example, um, it's considered a security feature. Um, like comparing checksums and these kind of things. If you do an integrity check and compare checksums with the data you've wrote to disk, it's sort of a, a resiliency feature, right? You want to make sure that there's no bit flipping going on when writing to disk. So um, sometimes the same action results in different categorization. So it's sometimes hard to differentiate. This is our favorite exception as Java developers, which I suppose most of you here are, uh, the out of memory exception. Um, which usually meant like you have to shut down your JVM and restart it again. Um, if you manage to prevent this kind of exception in your application code, uh, is this a security feature? Is this a resiliency feature? Because after this exception happened, the behavior of the JVM is undefined. Um, and that potentially can mean you leak data or anything like that. This is an Elasticsearch specific thing. Uh, I'm going to talk about that at the end if we have time. Um, this is a general thing. Like if you deal with any kind of credentials in your system, uh, make sure you don't accidentally expose them in your API endpoints uh, because they are just part of your regular configuration or anything like that. And this is another interesting one. Is every one of you knowing what their own application is doing if you run out of disk space? Like, what happens? Is the application just stopping? Is the application trying to write things? Is the application deciding writing this part of your application is important because it's maybe live data, but I stop writing logs? Um, you can change or like, decide what you want to do in this behavior, but, but it's a tricky thing. In uh, Lucene, which is the underlying library in Elasticsearch being used for full text search, uh, running out of disk space while writing could end up in corrupted data. So we basically put something on top of that to prevent writing when running out of disk space. We just stop writing. Uh, but these are all kind of things you have to keep in mind when having and running your own application. Next thing, back to Java developers. Who of you knows if it's possible within your own application at some point in your application to call system exit and kill the process? Like, can you prevent this? Do you have scripting enabled which, which allows you to run this? Uh, it's, it's important to, to think about these kind of things because I don't want anyone in my system to be able to, to call system exit. All right. We all remember Donald Rumsfeld and his famous reasoning um, to start the, the second invasion of Iraq where he talked about known unknowns known knowns and unknown unknowns. And I think he was talking about this as part of an IT security expert. Um, so if we sort of depict this into known knowns, 
and we map this to security, this could be things uh, which you may be not doing in your default distribution, but you know it's up there. For me, the classic thing is like file permissions. There are so many products out there where they have a securing your product guide where they're like, oh yeah, you should fix file permissions. Like, if you know that this is something you should fix, please fix it in your distribution and don't tell other people to uh, run a chmod command or anything like that, right? Like, if you know things and you know it can be fixed, like, do it for your customers instead of have them doing it. Then there are the, the known unknowns. What is this? Um, I would say this is something like application level exploits. If someone finds a security hole in, in our scripting language implementation or something like that, uh, if we had known about this concrete bug, we would have fixed it. Uh, while we can never be sure that there is not such kind of bug. And the last thing, the unknown unknowns for me is like the, the most classic thing occurring last year, is Spectra, where you as an application developer wake up in the morning, check your emails, and you're like, well, shit. Right? There's not much you can do in terms of defense against these kind of things, uh, and they happen, but you still have to deal with them in, in your own application. All right, question. Who of you ever called system set security manager in their own code? Exactly, zero hands. That's what I usually get at any Java user group as well. Who of you has ever used the security manager or activated it? Single person. That's also the average. Um, which brings us to the point, what is the security manager? The security manager basically allows you to sandbox your Java application. So what you basically do is you can configure um, your Java application to prevent certain calls, right? You can prevent opening files. You can prevent writing files. You can prevent opening a socket or listening to a socket. Um, you can also can prevent opening certain URLs or system properties, anything like that. And the whole idea stems from the far, far past. Some of you still might be able to remember Java applets, which is basically the exact same thing that JavaScript is doing in the browser nowadays. You're basically taking someone else's code and run it on your local machine. From a security perspective, this is the worst thing you can do, but since we have browsers, everyone is doing it on a daily basis and it's considerably accepted fine. Um, and the whole point of that is that if you take someone else's code and want to run it locally, you want to make sure it's not doing anything bad or stupid. You want to make sure it's not reading ETC PassVD and exfiltrating it somewhere. Um, and this was the whole idea of uh, Java applets back then, right? You could take someone else's code, run it locally, but at the same time you could be sure it's not able to run other people uh, to, to read your files or send them over the network or anything like that. So you basically, you were the one defining the security policies and then you, uh, you ran other person's code. And this is exactly what the security manager did back in the day and still today, but it's, it's just used uh, much less. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, if we had more time, I would give a fancy demo here where I just show the security manager features and that you're not able to read a file or write a file if it is enabled. Uh, the most interesting part of this demo was basically that you have the ability to change fields which are configured as public, static, final, or private, static, final, in your Java classes. You can just change the value if you want using reflection. Um, and then people are like, but this is a problem, but it's defined in the Java language specification that this is a desired feature to actually be able to change those kind of fields which you as a programmer wanted it not to be modifiable. Um, so let's talk quickly about the drawbacks of a security manager because apparently no one is using it and you should probably think about why, and there are a couple of reasons. First, by default, you have to hard code the policies before you're starting up. So you have to say, I want to be able to write this file, I want to be able to read this file, and so forth. And imagine that you're a service-based or server-based application like Elasticsearch. The first thing you usually do is read a configuration file where your files or where your configuration is written in. This is where I want to write my log files. This is where I want to write my data files. So, this kind of approach is not working uh, for these kind of processes. By default, DNS lookups are cached forever. This is just um, a default configuration when the security manager is enabled, uh, which kind of makes sense because DNS is a horrible, insecure protocol, and we still rely on it. It's pretty funny. Um, and this also means that you can't really run this in a cloud-based environment, right? When you run this on AWS and like IP addresses keep changing in the background, the JVM doesn't update them. Uh, and that, of course, is a problem. So you have to make sure that this doesn't happen. And this is the biggest part, actually. Um, 
Running the security manager enabled means you have to know every single of your dependencies. What code are they running? Is my dependency of a dependency using reflection to access some fields? If you don't know this, it's going to be extremely hard to really figure out, um, yeah, can I run or can I enable the security manager? The next problem is, because there are so few people using the Java security manager, um, that if you use your dependencies, you can't be sure that you're actually running the same code path um, that the dependency is running on the CI of this dependency. Uh, this happened to us with Netty a lot. Netty was not supposed to run with the security manager, and when we started adding this to Elasticsearch, uh, we basically had to, to come up with a couple of pull requests to fix Netty first. And of course, it's, it's not a protection against everything. Um, if I find a way to create an out-of-memory exception in my code, or if I find a way to create a stack overflow, I can still be able to exit the JVM, right? This is not a protection against everything. It just protects against certain things. Granularity is a problem. I have to configure every single permission that I want to allow within the security manager. So this is really tedious, especially if I have a ton of dependencies. Uh, and we're going to talk about that later, how Elasticsearch is doing this. And if you're using Java agents, uh, there's no protection as well. The Java agent is basically loaded before the rest of your Java application. The Java agent is able to modify bytecode. Um, so the Java agent has all the freedom it wants to do, like a ton of, of APM tools, for example, are, are Java agents doing that. Uh, and that usually means like, if you use a Java agent, you're entering a whole different game again. OK, something slightly different. Um, Production mode was development mode. This is less of a security thing, more for making sure Elasticsearch works as intended thing. Um, and there's a blog post, which basically has exactly the same uh, title as the subtitle here, knowing you now instead of devastating you later. And before we get started, I'm going to ask a stupid question. Uh, is your dev setup equivalent to production? Totally not, because otherwise we would all be running MacBooks in production, which is super unlikely. Um, and But this means, like, how can we make sure as Elasticsearch being a product, um, that there are certain preconditions given in production, but not when you run it on your notebook. For example, Elasticsearch needs a decent amount of file handles open at the same time because it's using Lucene under the hood, and Lucene needs a certain amount of open files. And if you're just running on your notebook trying things out, I don't care for this limitation. But if you're running in production, um, and in the middle of your production system, uh, like we can't open more files. This is an issue, right? So we want to make sure that we are able to open a decent amount of files when running in production. And this gives us a question, what is a good indicator to decide if you're running in production or not as Elasticsearch without knowing the environment? And also, the only thing we don't want to do is basically have a configuration flag in production true or false. Because if you add this kind of flags, every user is going to set it to false and you're going to lose this game, right? So we thought a little bit, like, what's a good indicator? Anyone has an idea? It's a distributed system, small hint. The network. So we thought the network is a good indicator. Like, if we are not running on localhost, but we are running on hosts, and we are binding on an external IP address, this is probably a production setup. And we kind of wrote this check, uh, where we're basically checking, uh, is the address that Elasticsearch is bound to, a loopback address or not. If it's a loopback address, we are a development setup. If it's not, we are production setup. And we were super smart and thought like, all right, we solved this problem, great way, going forward. Turned out there was this kind of little thing. And this thing here is nothing else like a software-defined network, right? Which basically means if you run Elasticsearch within a Docker container, you suddenly have an external address, which basically also means um, this is supposed to run in production mode. But most people also run Docker on their development setup. So we had to come up with another idea. And this is basically the last line in the, in the return statement uh, where we said that we have a special configuration option you can set to single node, which means this, this system will never be able to form a cluster. It's always running as a single node. And this also disables our production checks. Which brings us back to the question, what are our bootstrap checks? Or what are they exactly doing? And you can sort of categorize them into, into two core categories. One is things that the operating system has to fulfill, and the others are preconditions that the JVM has to fulfill. 
Um, from a JVM perspective, for example, we want to make sure you're not running any early access JDK builds in production, right? We can't guarantee any behavior in there, so uh, we exit. Um, we want to make sure you're not using some weird garbage collection setup like the serial garbage collector, which would mean it would be crazy slow. We also want to make sure you're not running on the client JVM mode, which means that the optimizations um, kick in later or not at all. Um, also, there's a certain combination of the G1 garbage collector in a certain JVM that produces corrupt uh, JIT code. And if we detect this, we can just exit and tell the user, look, please upgrade your um, JDK before going any further or change your garbage collector. The other part on the left side is basically um, checks for the operating system. So we want to make sure that the um, number of open file handles is not high enough. We want to make sure that the number of threads the user can actually open on the operating system is high enough. This is stuff you can usually set with ULimit. Um, same for the maximum memory size or virtual memory size, which is used for uh, memory mapping files. Um, we also have a check for the maximum file size. By default, on most file systems you use, you can use arbitrary high uh, file sizes. But if you're running on certain networked file systems, this is an issue. Um, there's also a so-called mlock all check, memory locking. Memory locking is a really, really nice feature where the process can basically tell the operating system never ever swap me out, never ever put me on swap space. Um, and the operating system after that tells the process, okay, I'm not ever gonna swap you out, or sorry, you tried, but I will swap you out if I need to. Um, and basically, if the system, if the setting is configured, but the system call fails, Elasticsearch also exits. So if any one of those checks fails in production, Elasticsearch exits, gives you a nice error message, like this is what you should do in order to re-enable this, this is our link to the documentation, uh, please go ahead and fix it. Uh, because this is super, super important to us that all those checks are basically fulfilled before running production. All right. Um, reducing impact. That's an interesting one. Um, of course, we always want to have this least privilege principle, uh, which, for example, may mean that we don't want to run as root. Uh, we also want to make sure you can't fork a process, and I'm going to get to that in a second. We also don't want to expose any sensitive settings. We want to run with the security manager enabled. Uh, and I'm going to talk about like, how we do these kind of things in Elasticsearch. The first thing is like, don't run as root. It's pretty easy, right? At the end of the day, you just have to check, am I UID no, uh, zero? Uh, and if I am, let's exit. And this is pretty much what Elasticsearch is doing. As you can see, we can't properly detect this on our windows. Um, so we have to be on another operating system, which is very likely a Unix clone. We call get EUID, which is a native system call. Uh, if that returns zero, we are basically exiting. Um, of course, this is kind of a lie because the security model of Linux is not about being UID zero or not. Um, the security model of Linux, for example, is about capabilities, and UID zero basically has all the capabilities. Um, but this is sufficient for 90% of the checks because I don't know of a lot of people who have another user who is not the ID zero, which has all the capabilities. Again, this is all it needs. If you need to do this in your own code, just feel free and copy it. The next thing is SecComp, um, secure computing mode. And we always have to take in consideration that the security manager can fail, right? Um, as every one of you apparently doesn't use it, there's a high likelihood that there's code in it which potentially has bugs. And we still don't want to be able to fork any processes or do any things. Um, and if you take a look at most of the security vulnerabilities still today, um, at least for example, take PHP, someone usually finds a way to execute commands. This is like the average security vulnerability. So, of course, you can try and, and like mask any input, mask any output, parse it, and so forth. Um, but what if you just tell your, your computer or your operating system, just don't execute fork calls, just do not do this. And this is exactly what SecComp is doing. SecComp um, is a feature within the operating system where the process itself can tell the operating system, if I should ever do any of those four system calls, those are the average system calls you need to execute commands, just disallow this, don't do it, right? And this means even if there's a security vulnerability and someone finds a way to execute processes within Elasticsearch, it's forbidden by the operating system because we configured this on startup. And the great thing about SecCom in general is it works on all operating systems. It has a different name on any of those operating systems, so you have to check the, the documentation for each of those. 
But this, this whole principle of adding this kind of one-way transitions works on all operating systems. Next step, sensitive settings. I think all of us at some point have like usernames and passwords in their configuration files. Um, so you have to take care of those kind of things, right? Especially if you have APIs like Elasticsearch has, which sort of allow you to dump all of their configuration via REST API. Um, these kind of settings should not be dumped. Um, so what can you do? Uh, this is, again, just regular Elasticsearch code. We basically have a so-called settings class. Um, and the settings class allows you to, to um, yeah, add, add or configure settings. Um, and the interesting part is you can mark a setting as being filtered. And if the setting is marked as being filtered, it will never be returned when an API call is made. So we can just go through all of the settings. If it's filtered, it's not going to be returned. Uh, one more thing you could keep in mind is that you probably should not put um, these kind of configurations in your clear text configuration files. So usernames and passwords, for example. Um, so Elasticsearch has a mechanism called secure settings. Uh, which allows you to put these kind of settings in a Java key store. Um, so it's, it's not stored uh, on clear text on the, on the disk. And there's another advantage of this approach. Um, and this is you should always register all your settings. Why? Imagine I'm going to uh, start Elasticsearch like this. So I configure minus E is a configuration parameter, which I can also put in the configuration file. Uh, and if you look closely, I'm unable to type name in cluster.name. And what happens is that there's an exception being returned on startup, so Elasticsearch doesn't start up. And we can say, there's an unknown setting, cluster name R. Did you mean cluster name? Why? Because every setting is registered. And now we can just compare the, the setting which has been typed with the setting that we have registered. And by just using Elevenstein or whatever uh, comparison, we can just say, like, look, this is, should be probably cluster name. Go fix it. Um, the other advantage of this approach is um, that the, if you register all of the settings, uh, you can pretty much know if there's an invalid setting in your YAML file, if there's an invalid indentation. I'm sure there are tons of people who have searched half an hour for the in, uh, indentation in your YAML file because something was just off by two characters. Uh, and these kind of things can be prevented if you just make sure that your parsing is strict instead of just taking your YAML configuration, pass it to a map, and then go through the map step by step. All right. Let's talk about Security Manager in, in Elasticsearch. So one thing uh, that needs to be kept in mind is uh, we have to do some sort of initialization before we can start the Security Manager, right? We have to read our configuration files. Um, we have to run this native code that I showed earlier on, like checking if we are root, right? These are all system calls which we want to do at the beginning in the bootstrap uh, time, but then we don't want to do it anymore. Or memory locking, we, we have to do a native call for memory locking. Um, so yeah, this is basically what we need to do. We need to run the native code first. And the solution to this is actually pretty simple because you can not only start the security manager uh, with an argument on the command line, you can also start it programmatically in your code. And this is exactly what we're doing. So you sort of start with an empty security manager, you do all of your fancy bootstrapping work, and then you enable the security manager. And the whole nice part about the security manager framework, basically, is it's super extensible, which basically means we run our own special fancy security manager, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Again, the default security manager comes from the time when Java applets were enabled, which is, I don't know, 15 years ago or something like that. Um, so it's, it's quite some time. And back then, for example, exiting your VM was a good thing, right? If you run other people's code and this code is calling system exit, the security threat suddenly vanishes. It's the best thing that can happen, right? If the process kills itself, we don't have to worry about security issues. Uh, if someone exits Elasticsearch in their code, and this is a server-based process, I would be deeply worried, so I want to prevent this. And this is the reason why we have to have our special security manager for, to, to prevent this kind of issue. Um, also, there's um, threat pool or, or threat group security enforced. Um, so by default, you cannot just add new threat pools and run them. Uh, you have to have a special permission for this. Uh, and this is also disabled by default. And we really wanted that because we want to have control over the threat pools and how they're run within, within Elasticsearch. You can also add your custom permissions. And we're going to see in a second how this, how this looks like. Um, 
For example, we have a special markup permission called special permission. You can see we're good with naming. Um, and this prevents elevation by scripts. So before we execute a script, a script is again just another piece of code um, written by the user. Uh, we want to make sure that this permission has been called, otherwise the script won't be executed. The whole idea is if someone finds a security problem in our scripting engine, he needs to circumvent this security issue, uh, this security fence as well, which is, from our perspective right now, of course, super unlikely. Um, the, the way that the configuration is loaded is called a policy in the security manager. And by default, the policy is read from a single file. Uh, but because Elasticsearch also needs to take its own configuration into account, the YAML configuration file, where the data is written, where the, um, where the log files are written and so forth, we basically have a special policy there as well, which is called ES policy. And there's one last bootstrap check. Um, so there's a special permission within all the security manager permissions, which is called the all permission. And it's a great one, because the all permission allows everything which is bad, right? We don't want Elasticsearch to be run with this permission. Uh, so what we do is we have an explicit check on startup, like if you, out of whatever reason, enable the all permission, and if you did, we exit. We don't want to run in an insecure mode, right? We spend a lot of engineering effort to run in the secure mode, so we don't want anyone with a single setting to, to not run it. Which also bears the question, like, why the hell does this permission exist? Like, who the hell would want to run with the all permission enabled? But the solution for this is actually pretty simple, um, because when you enable the all permission and you enable logging for the security manager, you can see all the single accesses that the security manager is actually doing, which means you get some sort of log file to be able to enable certain permissions for your own software. So for debugging and getting to know, this is useful, but if you want to run something in production, you never ever want this permission to be applicable. All right. So this is how we basically edit the security manager. And the last two chapters are, are more about plugins and scripting. So plugins, again, are bad, right? You, you're basically writing a software, and then you're allowing someone else to run code within that software, which from a security perspective is something you really don't want to do. If you can't try to prevent it, and if your customers don't want it, don't ever offer plugin support, uh, which for us obviously was not an option. Um, one of the reasons why you do want to have plugins is usually that you don't want to spend maintaining all this code that is out there yourself because you don't have the manpower. But if there are users who need a certain feature, they still have the ability to write their own plugin and extend the existing functionality. Um, so this is one of the core reasons of, of allowing plugins. And plugins in Elasticsearch are basically just zip files. Um, and the interesting part within Elasticsearch is that each plugin can have its own jars and dependencies. This also means that each plugin, if you have two plugins and one has dependency A in version 1 and the other one has dependency A in version 2, it's fine. There's no clashing with, the, with loading those dependencies. Why? Because each plugin is loaded with its own class loader. Um, you may know this functionality from, I don't know, Tomcat or any other web container where you can also just deploy two, two web archives with different dependencies and they just work as expected. The other interesting part is, is that each plugin can also have its own security permission. And this is super, super important. Um, for example, we have a, a mustache module or a plugin. I'll talk about that in a second, what a module is. And this mustache plugin allows you to use um, the mustache templating language in certain parts of Elasticsearch. Um, mustache means you need reflection, right? This is how usually templating languages work. They take a look at a Java object, and then they take a look at getters and setters and these kind of things. Um, or if it's a map, there are special ways of accessing the map. So you have to use reflection to introspect this object. Um, but if we allow reflection, which I said at the beginning is super, super bad, you don't want to allow reflection all over your code base. You only want to allow reflection for mustache. Um, and this is exactly what we can do by having an own class loader with own security permissions. So if you try to use any reflection feature outside of the mustache code base within Elasticsearch, you're going to get a security exception. And we are basically using this, this thing heavily ourselves. If you start up Elasticsearch, you usually get a list of modules loaded. And modules are basically plugins that ship with Elasticsearch by default. But they are able to use the same mechanism because each of those modules is loaded with its own class loader and with its own security permissions. So it's really helping us a lot. Uh, which brings us back to um, what are these kind of permissions. Um, so I just have a couple of sample permissions here. 
Um, this is the exact perm permission that you need for mustache. It allows you to do a reflection. Uh, as you can see, someone was apparently not a big fan of adding this kind of permission. Um, and this is the, the configuration file we ship with mustache. The interesting part is you can also define your own permissions. I talked about that briefly. For example, in this example, um, there's another script engine. It, it's called Expression. It comes from Lucene. Um, and the script, is, the script engine is basically a really nice idea. You can write your own scoring formula. And the scoring formula is um, translated into Java bytecode and then run, which makes it as fast as native code at the end. Um, the thing is, however, if you have a mechanism that creates its own bytecode, you also need your own class loader, which is why we have to add the create class loader permission. What we don't want to do is that someone writing a script can just create and instantiate arbitrary objects, arbitrary classes. So we have a class permission there, which has a really fine-grained list of things that you can do when writing your own code or when writing your own scoring script in there. So for example, you can use the Java Lang math class if you want to round or anything like that. Um, or the sloppy math class, which is, has faster rounding, uh, faster rounding methods, um, but you cannot instantiate a new Elasticsearch node within the code or whatever have you. And this is super, super important to us. Uh, you can also go a step further with these kind of permissions, and you can also grant them for certain dependencies. Um, so this is from our build, and while this file, when, when we create a build, this file gets changed so that the code base netty common at the top gets replaced with the name of the netty jar the netty common jar and its version. Um, and this basically only allows the netty jar in our code base to access this proc file. Um, so if anyone else within the code base, within our core, within a plugin, tries to open this file, it's going to be a security exception. But netty is allowed to do it because netty spills a 10-page long exception if it can't read this file on Linux. Um, same for the permission. Only the netty code is basically allowed to create network sockets and listen to them. Right? Only netty code can uh, create or can listen on the network, and this is really, really nice. So we don't have to worry in anything else of our code base that someone spins up, a, uh, spins up a piece of code that listens on the network. And you can go even further if you want and only give permissions to dependencies which have been cryptographically signed. So the security mesh allows far more than I've been talking about. This is really just the, the surface, but it's already a lot from, from our perspective. So yeah, that's the uh, that's the sample permissions. Uh, the last part is the the painless part. Painless is our scripting language for Elasticsearch, um, which usually brings us to the why and how we need scripting. Um, I think scripting is just another kind of plugin, if you want. Um, so for example, um, Elasticsearch has a functionality called Node Ingest. Node Ingest allows you to modify the JSON before it gets indexed. And imagine you have a document which has a bytes in and a bytes out field. Uh, a natural thing you want to have is a bytes total field, so you can do further calculations with this, uh, with this value. Um, so you could write your own plugin and just add those two fields, but of course this is super inflexible and you would have to maintain the plugin until eternity. Or you can just write a piece of script which accesses those two fields, sums them together, stores them in a new field. Uh, and this is basically what you can do with scripting, right? You can just basically write some code, but it's much shorter than if you would need to, need to write an Elasticsearch plugin. And scripting is on a, at a ton of different stages within Elasticsearch, so we make heavy usage of that. Also, scripting has been in Elasticsearch forever. Uh, when I started with Elasticsearch, I, I don't know, 2010 or something, uh, at my former company, um, there was already scripting, and I could do fancy things with this, like custom scoring, stuff like that. And the scripting back then used was Envil. Um, I'm not sure what the MV actually stands for. EL is expression language. It kind of looks like a horrible mix between uh, JSF and JSP scripting. So it's, it's not what you really would like to do, but it, it did the job. Um, but Envil turned out to not really be maintained anymore. Um, and it was not really fast either. So we looked for an alternative and we figured out, oh, there's Groovy. And Groovy was a, was a good choice actually, right? Um, uh, Groovy supported whitelisting and blacklisting already back then. Groovy had a sandbox where the code was executed in. Um, so it had a couple of advantages. And um, yeah, at some point we got an email from someone at a big uh, US corporation, and he was like, if I do this and this and this and this, I can execute arbitrary code in Elasticsearch. And he jumped through several hoops in Groovy, like escaping the sandbox. Um, and yeah, we, we reproduced it and we were like, well, yeah, okay, so the sandbox is not what we thought it is and we talked to the Groovy people uh, and they said, yeah, that's not a bug, that's a feature. Um, and from their perspective, I, 
it was actually okay. Um, but this basically meant we had to close certain things within Elasticsearch. Um, and this means it's super hard to take an existing programming language like Groovy and make it secure because you're always playing whack-a-mole, right? There's a new security hole, you've got to fix it. There's another security hole, you've got to fix it. Um, and this, this is not a game you wanted to play. And it also means you will never be faster than Groovy, right? Because you add so much like celebration code around it, um, it, it's hard to remain fast at all. So we kind of figured, okay, what if we write our own scripting language that supports sandboxing out of the box, that supports whitelisting over blacklisting, so you have to explicitly allow um, methods, and this also works per method. The groovy uh, whitelisting back then only worked per class, and this means if there was a class that, with a method that ate up a lot of CPU, there was not much you could do. Uh, we wanted the user to opt into regular expressions because regular expressions is usually a really safe way to block a whole CPU doing something if you write the right regular expression. Um, and because you control the execution environment, you can suddenly do really, really nice things. For example, you can prevent endless loops. Like, what, what if someone has a scripting language and executes code in your code base and he finds a way to execute while true, there's always going to be one CPU blocked. Um, and that was something we really did not want. And what we basically did here is because we control the execution environment, we can just count the number of loops we've been executing. And if it exceeds 10,000, we exit the script. Right? And this is all things you can do if you control the sandbox. The other funny part is detecting self-references. Um, if a user finds a way to create two maps and a value of one map points to the other and vice versa for the other map, and then you call two string on this map, you end up with a stack overflow, the JVM exits. Oh, this is something you don't want to have in your scripting engine, right? Um, so uh, this is also things we, we can just do, try to prevent and see uh, what happens, and this is also what we did. Um, and these are all things, if you offer these kind of, of scripting languages for your customers, like you have to audit a lot of things. You have to think about every possible way of abusing it, like be it regular expressions, loops, self-references, and all the other fancy things you can do, like making sure uh, the user cannot create arbitrary objects, right? Or just building a string builder with a length of one million characters or something like that. So it's, it's hard. And if you don't have to, please don't do it. All right. So we're going to get to the summary. Summary, uh, I did a really good job in summaries. Um, I'm just trolling here. It's great. Um, so not using a security manager. What's your excuse? Uh, I have a really simple one. It took us a lot of time to implement this with a lot of people. Um, I don't know of any other bigger open source project using the security manager by default, and I think this is the reason. Uh, I think we, we spent easily half a year or three quarters of a year adding this, implementing this. And when we added this first, we also had an option to disable the security manager to make sure like everything was still running as expected, uh, which is now removed nowadays, so you cannot disable the security manager when running Elasticsearch. Um, but it's, that's usually the excuse. Like You really have to know your software. You really, really have to know your dependencies. Uh, you really have to uh, be able to deal with all the permissions that you have to allow. And if you just allow everything and then you claim you, you have the security manager enabled, you didn't gain anything, right? Um, so like you have to adapt your whole model around the security manager to make this work. Same for scripting. Um, if you don't have to offer scripting in your product, just don't. It's pretty simple. Um, if you have to get it audited by someone external. I think that's a, a really good thing to do. Uh, please don't re-implement any security feature in your own code if the operating system uh, already offers a feature. Like I think SecComp is a prime example. Um, I sometimes see really fancy code of people in Java trying to prevent like runtime, get exec, whatever. Um, and they find a ton of ways of, of shielding this. Uh, but if you can just throw away your code because you can just configure the operating system to let the job be done, like, go ahead. Like, SecComp has been there for years. It's been battle tested. It's been proven uh, compared to the implementation you've wrote. And there's always someone smarter than you when you add a security solution who is going to, like, outscore it. So if you can use operating system features, same for the memory locking stuff, right? Um, if you can just tell the operating system to never swap out, you don't have to add any code in your own application to check for this. Uh, if you don't need plugins, hell, don't add plugins, right? Plugins is a hassle to maintain. Plugins is a hassle. Plugins are hard to, to be kept backwards compatible, right? For example, in Elasticsearch, 
um, we force every plugin author to have a plugin release for every patch release that we have. We have a check on startup if your plugin is for, um, if the Elasticsearch version is 7.1.1 and your plugin is for 7.1.0, we're not going to start with this plugin. We, so we put a lot of work on the plugin authors to make sure that everything works as we expect, right? Um, and this means uh, maintaining plugins is a bit of work, and you should probably keep that in mind if you, like, you and your platform open up for plugins. Yeah, this is the last one. Uh, I can quickly talk about that. Um, I don't think we have any, any further time for my bonus slides. Um, but sometimes you have to remove features. It's, um, for example, out of safety reasons. So Elasticsearch in, in earlier versions, one point something, I had a feature called delete by query, where you could just specify a query and all documents matching this query got deleted. Um, the way it was executed, basically on, on each nodes or an, on each nodes on each of the data in separate, could mean that under certain circumstances, while this execution was running, while someone added those documents back, that the shards, so the, the data and the copies of the data, were running out of sync. So you ended up with different documents in your, in your data. And this is something where Elasticsearch basically wants to give a guarantee for, that the data and the copy of the data is always containing the same. Um, and this guarantee was not given. So the first thing we basically did was removing delete by query. And then we wrote up an extensive documentation like, instead of just running this API endpoint, we urge you to, um, to call something or execute something called a scroll search, where you can basically go through each of your data and then send bulk requests in order to delete it. And of course, we got a lot of backlash, like, why did you delete this awesome feature? Um, and it took us another major version of Elasticsearch to first add the required infrastructure, running something for a long time in the background, a so-called long-running task or a task within Elasticsearch, where you could basically register these kind of things. And then on top of this API, we re-implemented what we had before, doing the exact same thing that we outlined in the documentation, like running a scroll search and bulk deleting the documents. And this proved to be uh, fast and stable again and be able to run in the background of Elasticsearch. Uh, so we, we had everything, but at some point, if you have this kind of features and you detect that they're not working as you intend them to be, it might be fine to just remove the feature first and then think about it, how you can basically add it back as long as you have a, a workaround, even if it's more work for the client. All right. Um, I have a couple of links here if you want to read about that. Um, but I'm not sure if we have time for questions, maybe one or two. Um, if you have further questions, I'm going to be around all day during lunch, whatever. Um, thanks for listening, and if you have questions, raise your hand. First one. Uh, do you use a dedicated security manager for every module or package that you run there? Um, yes. Okay. It's, it's a bit different in the code base, but the, the architecture-wise it basically is because of having dedicated permissions per plugin. Yeah. All right, lunchtime it seems. Two questions, two and a half. Yes. Yes. You can. It's if you check out the Elasticsearch source. There's a modules directory and there's a lang painless directory inside, and this is all you need. It's basically uh, its main dependency is uh, ant lr for the parsing of the language, and all of it is open source. Um, mainly because we don't do any network connections up until there. Everything is completely local. Before we do anything around the network or forming a distributed system, um, we, we basically run all the code we need. Of course, there's always the danger that you could do something bad or stupid in there, um, but the user cannot interact with the process until the security manager is enabled. Answers your question? You will discuss with me. I appreciate that. All right, further questions? Thank you.